first speaker is Ralph Kissel from the Cement and Concrete Association. Um, Ralph is a registered NZIA and AKB Germany member and is originally from Germany. He has worked for over 16 years as a project architect for a number of German and Irish based practices, during which time he was involved with a series of apartment developments, commercial and industrial and residential projects. Come in, Bobby. Um, Ralph's extensive list, list of achievements <coughs> has integrated a range of aesthetic and practical concrete applications, including precast panels, in situ floor slabs, and concrete masonry. Ralph has joined the CCANZ as the architectural project manager in March of 2009. In New Zealand, he has been the author of the CCANZ Code of Practice for weather type concrete and masonry. Uh, construction, concrete masonry construction. Uh, he has recently designed an apartment <coughs> mixed use development for the new urban village competition as an inner city site in Christchurch. Uh, Ralph has worked on a range of projects, several, several uh, multi story apartment and office retail buildings in uh, Berlin in Germany, and uh, has worked on an apartment block development in Dublin, Ireland. Um, so obviously Ralph's done a bit over the years, so put your hands together for Ralph, please. Thanks very much, Darren. And I have to say, Phil and Darren did it well. It's just really stunning, the food out there. I had the salmon, the best one ever. It's really good. And I understand you turned up. There are so many nice drinks here. Great to see a big crowd. Welcome to my presentation. Today I will talk about concrete masonry construction and requirements for petitions. So I just will start with a couple of things um, guiding to the standards we use in New Zealand for concrete masonry buildings. Then we go through a little process designing foundations for a standard home, walls and also bracing and a couple of things about weather tightness. That's kind of like the first part where I focus on concrete masonry construction. And the second part of my presentation will more deal with uh, requirements for partitions. You see all the apartment buildings coming, etc. And there are heaps of requirements in regard to sound, fire performance, but also durability. And I will just conclude with a small summary. The big question at the beginning, has ever anybody built with concrete masonry blocks of you guys? I mean yourself, wow, it's heaps, 50%. <coughs> you realize it's quite easy, it's pretty handy the material. <coughs> I uh, like to compare it to Lego for grown-ups. <laughs> so the most, the most would know what concrete masonry is. Obviously concrete blocks, mortar, rebar and grout. The blocks come relatively standardized here in New Zealand. So they are 190 in height, 390 in length, and then because of the one centimeter or 10 millimeter of mortar bedding, we speak of nominal height and nominal length. So the block plus the mortar makes it 200 or 400, and they come in a range of width, starting with 100 millimeter, going up to 250 millimeter. <coughs> the mortar bonds the block together, it's a layer of 12.5 uh, MPA strong concrete. Rebar, where I'm from, Germany and also the UK, we don't need rebar in the walls because there are no earthquakes. But here it's a bit tricky, so we have to reinforce our concrete masonry walls and at least, at least each 800, centi uh, 800 millimeter, there has to be one vertical D12 bar within the wall. And then we have the grout, and the grout simply connects, bonds, the reinforcing, and the blocks. Blocks come not only as the blocks, we also have a range of uh, ready-made solutions, like for example, corner block, or a lintel or beam block for vertical reinforcing, sill blocks, etc. So a range of variety of ready-made um, blocks to make life on site simply easier. <coughs> Now we can build either running bond, which is a bit more stable, the offset blocks, or stack bond. Stack bond I see with architectural designers and architects is a bit more popular, but for this you need always an engineer to design with. Whilst for running bond there is a standard we talk about in a minute, everybody can design too. You don't need to be an engineer for that. So this is uh, the standard 429, which I will cover in a minute. 
So testing, the testing of the blocks is done like any other concrete test cylinder in the laboratory and usually they have to achieve 12.5 MPa. There are also stronger blocks but in general they are 12.5 like the like the grout, uh, like the mortar. The grout is stronger but the mortar. And how do they look like? Obviously this is a natural block just coming out of the kiln. We can color them with inorganic and um, and organic pigments, split face where the block is just cut in the middle and then put into uh, two pieces. There's also the, the option to hone and to polish the blocks so to make the aggregate more exposed. Again, you can use it as veneer and for the veneer all the latter will apply as well. Just a, an example here, a nice piece of architecture from Verbs Architects for a batch in the, in the Auckland uh, North Shore area. They're using natural blocks and this is a combination of a home block and uh, also using a dark oxide to get this, this darkish color. So standards providing guidance to masonry construction. I have to put up front this uh, disclaimer here, Standards New Zealand, they normally sell the standards, they're not for free, even though the industry is writing these, but still we also have to buy them. It's a little bit funny, plus some standards are cited by the building codes, and they should be freely available, but they are not. Anyway, they say, okay, if you read out this or if you show this, you're good to go and you can copy some of our material, which I have done in the following. So the three New Zealand standards dealing with masonry in, in uh, our country are 4210, which sets out material and workmanship conditions. Uh, 4229 is the one we talk about possibly in more depth. This is the one where you don't need an engineer to design, uh, but there's a uh, scope limitation to 600 square meter and two and a half stories only, so residential. If the buildings are more complex, you need an engineer and he would use 4230 to design with. Other related standards, 3604 and the loading standards, 1117. However, so what does 4210 include? <coughs> a couple of things, obviously the materials, cement aggregates, water and admixtures, material storage and handling, initial preparation, also laying the units, reinforcing and how you place it, uh, talks about control and cracking control joints, the grouting process and also cleaning out. Then as well it talks about hot and cold weather construction which is above 25 and below 5 degrees, tolerances, chases, recesses, penetrations, propping and bracing during construction, masonry strength, veneers, testing and maintenance. So this is basically what 4210 covers. And then the next one, 4210 does not require an engineer, so anybody, even your son, your daughter, your grandma, your aunt, everybody could design to this standard because it's so simple that you can design your footings, your lintels, your bracing, etc. But on site you still need an expert, so somebody on site has to see that everything is going correctly here, and that can be an engineer or a licensed LPP. Then again, as mentioned, the scope is limited to 600 square meter and two and a half stories. And this, it talks about site requirements, bracing, foundation, slab on ground as well, and con control joints here, wall, walls, diaphragms, bond beams, little columns, and shrinkage. But then there are a couple of appendices, and this one is actually quite, quite cool. It's uh, a design example, a simple house, and they run through all the stages here, step by step, how you design your footing, how do you design your bracing, etc. So that if you follow this one, you could then take your own design and see to go the same steps. So that's actually quite handy. Then the more complex one, 4230, again deals with design requirements for the engineers, design for durability, fire resistance, reinforcing structural walls, beam column joints, also secondary structural elements, and there are a couple of appendices, some of them deal even with pre-stressed masonry, and then you go down to veneer. So this is quite a complex standard only an engineer would use. Looking now at uh, foundations, so there are two ways, obviously the wall foundation with a, uh, or the, the thickened slab edge here. And at some areas the walls have to be set into a rebate. This is for example the case when the uh, wall is only partially filled. But in today's time we normally fully fill the, the walls anyway because it's a little bit faster. Maybe a little bit more expensive but it's just really faster. 
And so now I just want to show you how easy it is to assess actually the footing to design the foundation for a simple building like this. So all we need to know is, okay, what is the weight coming from the walls here? And the second thing is, what is the weight coming from the roof? And now with this design, the designer has determined I want to use 200, 200 blocks fully filled and I have a light roof, a light corrugated metal roof. So then, um, and we have a couple of measurements obviously we need for that one as well. But then we just can go ahead, take the standard 4229, so this is now an extract from that standard. Uh, it's just a small bit of the table 61, which has a lot more to offer. But this is just enough for what we are looking at. We say we have a dense block, which is fully filled, which is 200. So the factor of unit weight is 4.6 kilonewton per square meter. So every meter we build that wall and every meter high we build that wall, it weighs 4.6 kilonewton. So but our wall is 2 meter 50, so that makes the wall weigh almost 12 or 11.5 kilonewton, which is pretty straightforward on the gutter side. Now on the gable side, we also have the little triangle there. The triangle weighs about 4.75, about 6 kilonewton. So the entire weight of the wall, going back to this a little sketch of this one, would be about 17 kilonewton. So this one, 2 meter 50 plus this one, 2 meter 50, that's about 17 kilonewton. And now we just have to see how much is the weight here on this side. We have less masonry because we don't have this, but we have more roof. So in addition, on the gutter side, we have to assess the roof weight. And 4229 makes it as well extremely easy no mathematical formula, nothing, you just have this little graph here provided. And from this graph you have the option to have a light roof, heavy roof, light roof and attic, or heavy roof and attic. And now we just have a simple light roof, so which is this line. The building walls are, I think, 7 meter 80 wide. Draw a line here, and then we conclude, okay, it's roughly 4.2 kilonewton per meter. So it's that simple. So this is the weight per meter coming down from the roof. Adding this one now to the wall weight, which was 11, so we come to 15.7 kN on the gutter side. Remember, on the gable side, it was 17, and the standard makes it simple for us. Always the larger weight governs for the entire footing. So we just go ahead with the 17.5 kN per meter, so we know exactly now this is the load on the foundation. All we need to do now, go into the next table, which gives us here the option, so all the loads which are in between 0 and 40 kN per meter, this, this foundation, if they are between 40 and 60, 60 and 75, etc. So what would you reckon, which foundation, how wide, how deep, and what reinforcing is it for our little building here? Which column do we have to choose? Yeah, absolutely, it's the first one. So it's uh, 70 kN, so it's between 0 and 40 kN. So it's, it's that easy, and this is how it looks. 200 high, 300 wide, two starter bars, um, are, uh, um, are six and uh, six, uh, 600 millimeter center stirrups. Two starter bars here. Um, are the, the starter bars are each 800 millimeter at least, so that's a minimum reinforcing. And then we have the 2D12s just sitting here. So this is the reinforcing and the measurement of the footing for that building. It is that simple, and every council will have to accept that. Now, walls. Walls, we talked about it in the very beginning. The components are the blocks, the grout, the block fill, and the reinforcing. The mortar and the block strength, they are equally 12.5 MPA. The joints always have to be tooled and slightly compressed. Even if we apply a render system or something over it, they always have to be compressed and tooled. Um, the mortar bed, the vertical joints, must be no less than the face, so it always has to come from here to there has to sit fully, fully covered. And then the grouting is a kind of a low aggregate um, concrete consisting of 17.5 MPA. So the grouting is just stronger to make sure that the um, reinforcing and the blocks bond perfectly together. But then also we have clean out openings. And they are really important because what happens when we put the blocks up, there will be always some some mortar spilling over or just um, compromising the cavity. And the mortar is just 12.5 MPA and the grout is 70.5 MPA. So that would mean that we would compromise 
the ground. So we have to clean it out with a broom so that it all falls down. The inner side of the void of the blocks should be really clean. And then we get it out through the clean up openings and then we can pour the concrete in. You also see that the blocks are upside down here in the bottom row. This is simply so that the concrete flows everywhere and creates a better and stronger bond. Now we need also, we need vertical bars, not only each 800 millimeter, but also at all corners and ends of the walls, at each side of, wall, of windows and doors, as long as they are larger than 400 millimeter, and either side of shrinkage control joints. Horizontal bar have to be provided immediately above and below, and openings obviously with a B, we obviously do reinforcing, but you need it also here in the cell area just below the window and, yeah, and, and again vertical enforcement is also required every 800 millimeter just so whatever it has to be just there and horizontally you're good if you just have maybe kind of like a diaphragm with a slab and the next reinforcing is at 2 meter 80 but only for partial fill. If you have fully filled wall you need to have a bar as well each 1 meter 20. The specification of the ground is also described in that 4210 workmanship and materials, 17.5 MPA. In some areas it can be required to be even 25 MPA, like in coastal areas. And in addition, you can use a special expanding egg mixture, which makes it flow more easily into the gaps. Otherwise, you have to vibrate and um, compact the concrete, which can injure very, very easily the reinforcing. So it's better to use actually a uh, expanding at mix. Um, then again, there are four methods. Four methods to get the grout into the wall. There is the high lift grouting with expensive air mixture. This can be a go into up to three meter sixty. If you don't have the air mixture, it's one meter twenty and more compaction required. Low lift grouting one twenty, high lift grouting with reduced compaction two meter forty. You may just forget about the letter three. The first one is actually the one normally every builder uses here. So it's the high lift grouting with an expensive app mixture. So you clean out uh, the void first and then you add obviously the expansion add mixture to it. You grout the wall in a semi-continuous operation which, which means you go along the wall and pour it just to 1 meter 20 but you don't have to wait until it's really set. You just continue and come along there again. So it's kind of like three rows until the grout is in. That's the ideal process. And um, you have to wait for, let's say, half an hour at least when the concrete is fully filled. And then you have to trowel off just the top because of the expansion admixture. There will be a little bit of surplus on top. It has to be troweled off so that you get a nice flush finish. And this is about then shrinkage control joints. We need shrinkage control joints for the ground, not for the blocks. The blocks are fully cured. They sit on the storage for, I don't know, two months, three months, half a year. They're fully, fully cured. But the grout will still lose water over the time, so there is shrinkage hap uh, happening, and we have to accommodate to control the location of the cracks. So and that has to be at least every six meter, so no longer than six meter. And if you come to a corner, it's actually either five meter 20 at a maximum, 600 millimeter here, or if you have kind of like, um, want to have for whatever architectural reasons, have it in an equal space, then you can go with 3 meter 20 at both sides, but not 6 meter on the corner, 5, 6, 5, 20 is the maximum. Then again, we need a crack control joint also at L-shaped corners, so as we show here, but also at turns of T-junctions and U-junctions and U-shaped floors, also at changes in wall height, so if you have a wall, let's say 2 meter 50 and the next one is 3 meter 50, then you need a control joint there. And as well, if you change the wall thickness, you may have a retaining wall, maybe 250, and the other wall, suddenly, you know, the lens slopes down, you continue with the 200 wall, then you always need a shrinkage control joint. Um, how does the reinforcing look in control joints? They're actually interrupted, but lapped by an additional bar but the one side of the lapping is debonded, maybe by use of a DPC or something like that, but it has to be debonded, except you are uh, within a lintel or a bond beam. Then the reinforcing would go through. 
bracing, earthquake and wind bracing. So we need to brace our windows against earthquakes and against wind. Um, the braced wall panel is used for bracing. The maximum allowed opening in any braced wall panel is 400 by 400. The maximum height is 3, uh, 3 meter or 3,000 millimeter. If it's higher than this, it would, you have to be, uh, it would have to be accounted. You would either have to use an engineer or if you think of a two-story building, then each story have to brace, have to be braced on its own. Minimum length 800 millimeter, and the capacity of the bracing panels is measured in bracing units. So one, or let's say 200 bracing units is equivalent to the power of one ton, so that's quite something. Um, and our bracing panels are all rolled up on a line, on a bracing line. So with our simple buildings, there were just four external walls. Each external wall also represents one bracing line. The bracing line can, but the bracing line can be one meter away from a bracing wall. Why would that be? For example, if you have suddenly maybe a bay window or something, which then the wall, the main wall sits here, but the bay window goes out maybe two meter and two meter that way and then two meter in again, then you could just set the bracing line in the middle of these two walls and still this counts for the one bracing wall. And for all the bracing lines, um, each of the bracing lines has to achieve at least 60% of the entire bracing capacity of the building. This is just because the engineers writing this standard for the line thought about it has to be really secure when there is no engineer needed. Uh, there's just an exception if there's one bracing line providing already 100%, then the one on the other side can go away with 30%. But the rule is generally with 60%. So what do you <coughs> now need to know to gather the, uh, uh, the information about the bracing capacity of our building. We want to know what's capable to do. So for that, we need to know where is it actually built, in which earthquake zone. We need to know the soil, the subsoil type we build it on, the floor levels, one or two stories, kind of the dead loads and the life loads, like um, the roofs and the traffic, and the footprint size is important as well. So going back now to this simple building here, we could just say that this is built in Wellington. We use this type of wall, 200 millimeter, with a light roof, and we build on a subsoil class C. So when we have gathered all the information, we again go into 4229. There, there are several tables. So the first one is here, the table which determines the earthquake zone. So we said Wellington, that's earthquake zone 3. Auckland would be easy. It's not very risky here, so it's all pretty stable. It would be earthquake zone one. Christ, Christchurch one, funny wise, is zone two. However, once we have, we have gathered the information, there's another beautiful table with heaps of information. This is as well just an extract. The table is much larger, but for our sample building, this is just enough. So we know we have a single story house with a light roof. We also, we have said we have a, part, or we have a wall, 200 uh, series but it's solid filled. So that means if we use a partial fill building a wall, one single story lightweight roof in earthquake zone three, usually we need 28 bracing units per square meter. But if it's even solid filled, it has to be a bit more, a bit, a bit stronger. So we have to multiply <coughs> by 1.4, so we achieve roughly 40 bracing units per square meter. But then again, because um, all the tables consider uh, that we would build on a subsoil class E, so the weakest one, if we build on a better ground, we can also mul multiply it here with a, with a multiplier from, from the subsoil class. So in this case, with about 0 0.8, so which uh, gives us a final result of 31 bracing units per square meter. So now we know for this building, which I showed there, we need 31 bracing units per square meter, so which is roughly like 100, 120, 130 kilogram per, per square meter. Now the footprint of our building uh, equals to about 102 square meter. That times this bracing unit um, results in 3,174 bracing units. So now this is the this is the final result for this building. We need 3,174 bracing units um, to withstand earthquake loads. You would always go and check maybe the wind loads because it's another strong power. 
but um, I can say in about 99% the earthquake loads is, now, is much, much stronger. And I haven't, sh I will not show how it works with the wind load, but it's very similar as well. I can tell you for this building. So you would look at an across and a, uh, across a ridge and a longer ridge a direction. So you get, and it's about 100, 100 resonance per meter. So the cross or along the ridge, it'll be about 1,200 grazing units you need, and um, along the ridge, about 850. So you see it's much, much less. So always the higher one governs. So this is the total grazing, uh, grazing capacity we need, 3,174. And the next step is now, obviously, how does our building achieve that? So for that, we need to look at the elevations of our building, at the grazing panels. You can just look at this one sample here. So we have obviously a construction draw, a shrinkage control joint here and there. We have an opening here. So the bracing panel always stops at either an opening or at a control joint. So with this wall, we have four bracing panels, two of each 2 meter 40 by 2 meter 40, and two of each 2 meter by 1 meter 40. And again, if we see this, we take this information, go into this table, the first one is a 2 meter 40 by 2 meter 40 panel. This one of them provides us already 820 bracing units. And the other one sits in between here, so we just interpolate quickly between the 1 meter 20 and 1 meter 60, so 1 meter 40, which gives us roughly 400. So 400 plus 400 is 800, 800 plus the other 800, so roughly we get a little bit more than 2,000. <coughs> 400 uh, bracing units. So this is alone the bracing capacity of this one bracing line, of the one wall. So here we have already 2,400 bracing units. The entire building needs 3,100. When we said earlier, each bracing line shall achieve at least 60% of the total we use, which will be 1,900. So this one is absolutely top. It's way over. It achieves it. And for the next three walls, we do exactly the same procedure and uh, we proved to council that this building with then is, is braced properly enough. So it's just these, these little steps. And I know it's a bit too much, a little bit too many digits and <laughs> numbers here. And that's why I recommend grabbing that, grabbing that standard, look into the back, there's an, uh, a work example, which is more or less this example, and then you can really take your time, cup of coffee, and you know, try to understand a little bit better. But it's not rocket science, it's relatively straightforward. It took me a while as well before I understood I'm <coughs> now here in a better position. But So, yeah. Uh, just look at that example building. Wasn't it 12 meters long? So, yeah. where does the 6 meter racing line go in the middle? Um, okay, there is also a requirement for the span. So, you, you can. You can go relatively wide with the span, so you don't need to do it in six meter. So you can go to eight meter or nine meter, given you have a bond beam, but every masonry wall has a bond beam, and given you have a diaphragm sitting on that level. Then you can go wider, and then you have, can create a span up to, I think, 16 meter, from bracing line to bracing line. With your example, the moment, yeah. showing the heights of the wall, yeah. Yeah, the wall came like 2.4, but the ones either side the door are only two meters tall. Yeah. Is there any reason for that? You can't use a 2.4 height? Uh, no, they just say it stops where the opening is. It's a little bit different than the approach of 3604. 3604 says always the entire panel from the, from the ground floor level to the gutter level has to be accounted for, but the guys who wrote this standard have approached it a little bit differently. They, they assume that a concrete wall uh, is in itself relatively rigid and stiff particularly under a window, so nothing will happen there, it's completely braced. So they say just take the pieces between the openings rather than the full wall. So that would be the same if you go back to the little uh, diagrams here. So for example here, you would only take this bit and this bit. They, uh, the engineers writing this argue this bit doesn't have to be braced, it's perfectly stable. What needs bracing uh, is the area around the openings. And the same applies then here. So this is perfectly stiff. Bracing is only required here, from here to there. That's how they have argued. So it's a little bit different than 364. And but yeah, it, it also performs a little bit different than timber buildings. It's a bit more rigid and a bit more heavy. So coming to the next chapter, talking about weather tightness for masonry walls. Um, there is a code of practice 
also we wrote a while ago the um, code of practice for weathertight concrete and concrete masonry buildings. This is cited by NB as part of the building code. So there's not only the uh, clause E2S1 for timber buildings, but there's also the clause AS3 for concrete buildings. This is the st uh, standard which is different to New Zealand, a free download from our webpage. You can grab it, it shows a lot of details. I will talk about it in a minute. And uh, it's in place since 2011 with a revision in 2014. So what kind of build-up it covers, concrete masonry walls with internal insulation, with external insulation, with integral insulation, like the hot block, but also masonry near. But then again, also for in situ concrete walls and for precast concrete walls. Weather time is for this build-up we find in that uh, solution. And the weather time systems we see here, the first one is the exterior insulation and finishing system, which is an EPS or XPS core with a mesh and then render applied, plaster systems, pigmented coatings, but also clear sealers, and masonry veneer. Those are the five weather time systems we can, can apply to concrete masonry walls. An EFES um, solution, for example, for, for, a, um, for a joint footing to wall, is very straightforward. You just bring the system down into the ground, about 100 millimeter. The only clue is the capillary break here, to, just to prevent capillary action to uh, water ingress here in this area. So this is uh, the only really tricky bit you have to consider. Um, if you build in a prone or on deck flashing with an EFES system, so the, the EFES would just stop here with its, with its own stopping profile section and drip section, and you bring up <coughs> your roofing membranes about 150 millimeter to this uh, place here where it's then sealed by, by a continuous <coughs> compression seal. And then you have to make sure that whatever you put, if, if there are um, if it's a timber deck or if there are pavers, they always have to be drainable. So the, the rule says here 150 millimeter from the water guiding, water leading area to the upstand, so that's or to the fixing, that's an absolute minimum. Uh, around windows, um, uh, it's recommended to apply an internal moisture seal. It's it's in fact actually more important for timber buildings, but still we recommend this. We don't want to have any internal moisture getting into the, into the joints here. Also make sure there's no thermal bridging. Then you have an external moisture seal eventually, and uh, then you can seal it with compression tape or with some mastic here around the corner. Bring your external uh, insulation system just a li little bit overlapping or let it overlap with the actual window frame so that, that there's also no thermal bridging given in this corner. Because we have seen many concrete houses where you have mold, particularly in this area, yeah, because when there's no thermal insulation, you have maybe five degrees here, 20 degrees inside the building. 12 degrees is roughly where the dew point sits in New Zealand. So at 12 point, uh, you would have condensation here, and that will stay and eventually lead to, uh, to mold. So always make sure it's thermally properly insulated. Similar to the um, to the lintel, the only difference is maybe the drip edge, and this comes with a, with a, a ready-made sill. If you can apply easily a ready-made sill system, just uh, perfectly made to fix it underneath the the windows, um, like they are made today. So that's actually relatively straightforward. A veneer system. If you apply a veneer system in front of a masonry wall, and so the clue is here the brick ties, they are fixed into the wall and then embedded into the mortar of the, of the, um, of the veneer. And you have to consider they only take lateral loads, so they can't take any, any vertical loads, it always has to be set onto to the foundation. The uh, cavity here, the free venting cavity has to be at least 40 millimeter compared to a 364 timber says 20 millimeter, 20 millimeter would be okay but Similarly, like with the clean out we had before, um, there will be always a little bit surplus of mortar sitting here, which may block the cavity. So we say 40 millimeters is the minimum. Insulation, and then you have ventilation opening on top and weep holes on the bottom. And this is actually a very, very weather tight and also thermally a very good performing wall. The brick ties, the wall types, has to be made uh, as per 4210. The ties to be fully embedded into the mortar. 
a general rule of thumb for the spacing of the ties is about 600 by 400 millimeter. However, this depends, this depends on, on the location where we build. Again, if we, if we are in Wellington, in the earthquake zone 3, if we use a heavy duty brick tie, so this means light, light duty brick tie, medium duty and heavy duty, so these ones are really strong ones. And even if you use the, the more heavy veneer, so you would need every 0 0.241 brick tie. But it's hard to imagine what that means, but it roughly means like possibly every 400 and 400 you need a brick tie. So this is about the, uh, the veneer. And again, also the detail looks relatively similar from the principle, like the other ones, internal moisture, external moisture protection. However wide your cavity is, you bring that block, cut it and bring it, bring it back in there and have a seal around the edge. There is a um, galvanized steel angle on top, uh, just to, to carry that, that lintel here. Um, in Germany we often use a little bit of uh, a different system, so we fix that angle actually to here to the wall and let it come in into that joint. And then there will be a hook just fixed to that one and the hook goes around to the last block and there will be a D12 just running in that direction. So that would have the effect that as the underside you see the same brick material and not the galvanized steel. Because many people say, ah, oh, it looks so ugly with galvanized steel underneath. So it's better if you, you can just show the brick as well as you show it on the side. And still, as well, don't worry about this. It can be open, it can be ventilated, but water can get in as long as there is a weather tight seal around this joint here. Because any water would just go down the drainage, uh, the, the cavity here, and drain out through the weeper holes in the bottom. Then the standard shows also a couple of details for masonry and for concrete walls when they join to lightweight buildings. So this is a horizontal section, block wall, veneer wall. So the clue is here, bring the building wrap just in and around so that it also uh, helps moving between the materials. Then there is a um, flashing fixed to that stud here. And the flashing is sealed against the brick. And there is then again kind of like, the, if you want, so the over flashing of the weather bars of your plywood. So this would give you a relatively or a very good uh, weather tightness uh, seal, which is cited and approved of the by the ministry. Uh, the other direction, vertical section, so mostly the veneer wall would be wider than the lightweight wall. So what you need is, is kind of a capping, overlapping, bridging this area. So the building wrap goes down here. Eventually you have a, a batten sitting there to create a little bit more distance. But the wrap goes over the flashing and then the flashing just goes over the joint. And again, if this is open, it's desired. It has to ventilate and out to the deeper holes. Similar for an IFES uh, system, external insulation, but in, in, uh, you just chase, chase the flashing in, into here. The principle otherwise is the very same. Um, on top as well, the wall is possibly not as thick as a veneer wall, but you can again have this overflashing sitting here, makes it nice and, and snug. And if you don't have any insulation, just render or just a coating, so if you want to show Amazing wall and to the outside world, you just bring along your render or coating system, whatever, to this endpoint, and then it's just important that you, that you see, chase and seal the flashing into the concrete element, into the concrete or masonry wall here. And a little bit different here because obviously the weather boards are projecting over the wall, so it's a little bit simpler to solve this problem here. Um, uh, last slide to weather tightness, um, we have to consider that concrete, according or in, in contrary to some uh, people's opinion, it needs work, it's not maintenance free, so we have to wash the surfaces at least once a year, that should be done, it's not done, I know, but it's better if it's done, we have to inspect the surface and see if there's anything wrong, repair cracks as soon as we discover them, inspect sealants is really important to uh, uh, particularly when you don't have constructive solutions, but if you rely on a sealant, it's so important that you then inspect the sealants and make sure they are okay. Inspect the paints, inspect clear sealers, <coughs> and just maintain required clearances, like for example, you know, if your 
So I think the top of the slab is always 150 millimeter higher than the ground level. Those clearances have to be um, have to be also dealt with and applied. So so far on the concrete construction. Now the second part will refer to tenancy partitions, just with all the apartments coming up. I'm pretty sure some of you build apartments at the moment. Am I right? Some designers here doing apartments or multi story units, so there are some uh, requirements for these. The walls, vertical barriers between the units, there are load bearing or non-load bearing, floors, there are always load bearing. Requirements for walls, sound barrier for example, you don't want to know every new composition of your neighbor, especially mm -hmm. not at 3 at night. It applies for walls and for floors. For walls it's more the airborne sound, but for walls we also have to deal with impact sound. <laughs> Impact sound can only be dealt with by decoupling the elements. I'll talk about that in a minute as well. Fire protection, it's a really, really serious uh, threat to our properties and lives. Um, and of course, it has to be light and vision proof. I mean, we are architects and architectural designers, and everybody knows you have to work at night. So, you know, we don't want to bother the other people. Light and vision proof, it have to be impact resistant as well durable against moisture and water, um, and capable to support fixture, and they also have to be, yeah, they have to be given a, a certain security, they have to be burglar proof. You may just go on holiday four weeks and suddenly your anonymous neighbor, you know, just took to all your uh, whatever, jewels, and you come back and there's nothing left. So they have to be also burglar proof. So these requirements, now one of the most tricky one is sound insulation. It's also one of the most bothering ones. There's heaps of medical research that noise disturbance in apartment buildings has a negative effect to your health. And Wellington Council did a survey asking about uh, 2,000 apartment dwellers, what they liked and did not like. Obviously, they liked the proximity to cafes and work, etc. But the biggest bother was the noise from city and neighbors. And Carissa did a survey uh, asking apartment dwellers in Auckland and 12% have actually stated they've moved because of sound disturbance. And just to distinguish, airborne sound is sound traveling through the air, generated by traffic, roadworks, people gathering, impact sound is traveling by footsteps on a slab or door slamming and plant devices vibrating. And um, this is just a sequence which gives you an idea of uh, So you can imagine it's hard to relax if you are, you know, after a stressful day, the, the client was tricky, you just want to relax at home, and then it's loud. But the city noise is not the worst, that's usually worse. So the worst is not the city noise, the worst is the neighbor. The neighbor and the music. And even on construction sites, um, there are often complaints with noise control here in New Zealand from construction sites, but you would possibly assume it's because of a drill or a jackhammer. No, it's actually because of the transistor radius of the builders. It's really, really astonishing. So noise control is really important. What are typical sound sources? What I'm doing here at the moment is possibly 75 decibel. It starts to become painful from about 90 decibel. What are acceptable noise levels? So. 35 decibel within a bedroom, I mean within the bedroom, from outside. So we have to uh, bring down the, the maximum noises, uh, say of 90 decibel to 35 decibel. We need our petitions to provide 55 decibel of sound attenuation. This is also what our building code requires here. Clause G6 requires 55 decibel airborne sound attenuation for partitions. This can be achieved with a 200 mm concrete wall or 150 mm concrete wall. And I think this is an extract from the building code here, so they have provided some options. 200 mm concrete masonry, 150 mm concrete wall, but there are also lightweight solutions which may work as well, but you can see they're quite a little bit larger. This is 150 compared to 250 mm. So over the length of a partition of, one, of 10 meter, that will be one square meter. So that's one square meter you could rather rent or you know, sell if you go for, for one of these options. 
However, this is what's provided by the ministry as guidance. For floor slabs, we also have to deal with the impact sound, and that can only be dealt with by separating the elements. So our building code is happy if we apply a carpet and an underlay on a concrete floor. And um, a lightweight solution is here as well, but you see there are kind of two structures involved, the one carrying the floor, the other one carrying the sound insulation. And again, you see 150 compared to 250 millimeter. That means 100 millimeter more services, more facade, more building, more height. It adds up to the cost at the end. Um, but how, if I, I work for the concrete guys, I love concrete, I love a concrete floor. <coughs> so if I go and buy the apartment and rip out the carpet, so there's no more sound insulation. So the better option is always a floating screed. This is, um, this is um, <coughs> mandatory, this is standard, it's mandatory and uh, to comply uh, with a building code in Germany, you have to use this system. So this is a floating screen, about 50 millimeter thick, unreinforced, sitting on a, well, let's say 20 millimeter sound insulation uh, uh, mat, and there's also a sound insulation strip between the wall and the screen, just to avoid sound flanking via the walls. It's a bit more tricky and a bit more expensive, but it works, and I think for our future apartment buildings, it would be possibly, yeah, it should be the way to go. Anyway, to recapture for airborne sound attenuation, we need mass, and for impact sound, we need to decouple the elements. A quick one on fire performance, I see a threat to properties and lives. This is a uh, building in London, a while, maybe five years ago or so. It was built of timber, triggering again the question, shouldn't be all structural materials be non-combustible, inherently non-combustible? However, fire, fire protection as we know it, sprinkler systems, intermediate paint, claddings or passive systems like materials which just don't burn like concrete masonry. Our clause says for apartment buildings and partitions, 60 minutes structural stability, etc. that's okay. But this 60 minutes, which is not much, can even be reduced if we install a sprinkler system. But there is a problem with sprinklers. Most of them are not fed by their own water reservoirs, but by public water water reservoirs. And all our raw water reservoirs are fitted with outer shut valves, which trigger and close and shut off water in an uh, earthquake event. So there may not be even any water when you most need it. So I think this is something the you know, building code should look at revising. However, at the moment it's still the case, and we can you know, apply intermediate paint to our steel structures up to three hours. It's a bit tricky with uh, poisonous gases, etc. You see that the guys uh, wear protection. But it can be done. Timber walls as well, you can achieve even four hours. That would, uh, would, um, would mean four boards each side, so about 210 millimeter. Or you can use concrete solutions. Uh, masonry blocks, for example, just using a typical gray rocky aggregate. A 100 millimeter wall, a 90 millimeter wall, say 100 millimeter pro provides already one and a half hour one and a half hour fire protection, which is increased safety, so increased safety for, for us to get, get us safe, to save others, for the fire workers to save the building. Uh, compared to Germany, again, 60 minutes, we need 90 minutes at a minimum, just as a kind of note, side note here. Durability is possibly the last big chapter I want to talk about because I think the time is running away. Is it right, Darren? Yeah. yeah. I make fast. So durability, why is it so important also for petitions and floors and apartment buildings? Uh, I think we are all familiar with these type of 1980s, 1990s buildings, no roof overhangs, no constructive solutions for weather timers. Then you get movements, particularly in Christchurch and Wellington, and uh, the lining cracks, the cladding cracks, and allows water ingress into the structure with sometimes a very, very severe impact. Talking to building surveyors in Auckland, uh, and they, they say that about 70% of all apartment buildings, including new ones, leak or will leak once during their lifetime. And they have reported one case to me where a 13-year-old building leaked from day one, so the leak was discovered just after 13 years, and 80% um, of the structural timber has to be today replaced. And a friend of mine is a structure engineer for a company in Wellington. They do a project in an apartment building in Auckland. It is, I think, five years old exactly, and some leaks have already rust, uh, caused rust of the steel structure, so that they need uh, to be replaced. Not as bad as this one, but still, you know, 
needs to be replaced. So that's why it's really important to think about the materials to use them in the right, in, in the right way. Timber is important, it's good, we need it, steel the same thing, but sometimes maybe for partitions or structural things, uh, maybe a solid solution gives us more advantages. However, this could happen if you have a leak in the facade or just the washing machine is leaking. You know, Suddenly, you know your neighbor better than you want. Mm -hmm. And uh, another thing also reported by building surveyors, somebody complained about noise and they were called in and they found out that the neighbor had cut actually out a section of the plaster wall, of the partition wall, to recess his television into the wall so it's nice and flush. And where's the sound rating of the fire rating? So this is exactly what happens. I think the next one is loud because it's pretty loud. <coughs> Sorry. Everybody awake? <laughs> so the question is what happens if the, um, I mean, try that with a concrete wall. <laughs> Get it will hurt. So that means if the, uh, the lining is uh, damaged, you know, there's no longer performance given, no longer fire or sound performance given. That's why it's really important to think about um, uh, durability and soundness of materials. However, costs are always very important, and I think Benice from Firth asked me, do we have something on cost? Yeah, we have, or Rawlinson's they had. And to compare the costs, so a 60 minute fire rated wall and 55 decibel town sound deterioration together, a <coughs> concrete wall would sit at 100% of the cost, and a lightweight wall would sit just at 85 or 90% of the cost. So it's quite a bit cheaper. But then again, nobody shall believe that they are the same solutions, because this one gives you inherently three hours of fire rating already. And to do that with this wall, the price would just go up. But again, that's not the only thing. I just want to make the point about the durability, because these walls are just much more durable. However, I think we always have to see those building materials in combination. So linings are great. I, I love them. But they should have their right application. For example, when there will be a new uh, building code for the sound insulation, they may increase you know, from 55 to 60 or 65. Then you can achieve it if you, in addition, you know, to the concrete wall, apply some lining and some, some sound rule. It's also good if you just want to have an, an alternative finish, like this one looks really flush and nice, if you don't want to have a masonry wall. It's also good if you have remedial work to do or you want to hide plumbing or electrical, just apply a plaster board in front of that. Or simply for internal unit division, not for the partition itself between the, the apartments, but for within the unit, it's very handy, obviously, to use just a lightweight uh, lining and chip board, etc. However, coming to an end with this slide, which is of a recent uh, Auckland Herald article, I just brought it up, I uh, just want to bring to your attention how many apartments building there are currently underway in Auckland. There are actually heaps. If the material and the quality is not okay, they eventually risk their whole life savings. And um, in this regard, I just want to conclude on this little presentation and just pledge for durability. It's really so important for us and um, I think you can't think uh, often enough about it. Anyway, thanks for your attention. I hope the time is good and we have now David, is that right? Thank you.